Yeah. 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 That was the right song choice. That was the right song choice. Yeah. Hello, all. Welcome. We're here, and the boys are back in town. So happy to be here with Eli Gladstone, Eric Silverberg. Uh, please, please uh, hop into the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. Already saw, I believe, Mary is here. Hey, Mary, thanks for joining again. Um, hop in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Let us know where you're joining us from. And even what you're hoping to get from this session with us today, speak up and speak well with Eli and Eric from Speaker Labs. I'm so pumped to have these two fine gentlemen here because they're very, very close personal friends of mine. Um, Eli and I literally grew up together spending summers together at an amazing summer camp called- Right camp. off the bat, you're alienating me that I didn't grow up with you for as long as Eli? Do you want me to start over and I can talk about you first? Would that be better? <laughs> no, or? no, I'm just- Your second fiddle, you didn't go to Camp White Pine, so- You're sorry. right, you're right, you're right. When you're right, you're right. <laughs> amazing. Um, and Eric, Eric, you and I met in university at Western- Sure did. Uh, university of Western Ontario, though- um, you're a brother from another. We have so many common friends and we clicked immediately. Yep. Um, and these are two of the most genuine and generous people that I know. Um, Eli, Eric, and I, we've made it a point to come together for lunch or a meal or a Zoom conversation. If it doesn't happen like once in six months, we start just like shaking and doing weird <laughs> stuff and then we come back <laughs> together. Um, and they, they started their careers um, lecturing uh, at business school at Western, fell in love with it. Like there, it's a job they're made and born for. Did some work in the corporate world, and they're like, we can do this. Uh, they have a passion for presenting, a passion for teaching and entertaining and educating, and so they've started Speaker Labs, which you guys have been doing for how many years now? We're coming on six in August. Our mm -hmm. founding date, I believe, was August sixth. So it's our champagne birthday, I guess, coming up on August 6th this year. So five and a half, six years now. And, and you can drink champagne when it's the sixth year anniversary of a company. Yes. Uh, a little bit different if you're turning six, as my daughter is actually in a couple of weeks. Um, but so they've been doing Speaker Labs for six years, and they literally are world class at helping people become better, uh, amazing speakers. So... Uh, I'm passionate about speak up and speak up cultures and how we cre can create these environments where people feel safe to speak up. These two gentlemen are so good at, all right, once you're ready to take that stage or step in, whether it's in a one-on-one -on -one group or a, a big platform that you do it and you do it well. So we're going to chat about their work. Um, uh, Eli and Eric have some surprises up their sleeves as well and use me as a guinea pig because I like to do that. Uh, and and uh, help us learn by trying some games and stuff out. So I really don't know what they're going to do, but they're going to do it. Um, Eli, Eric, any other opening words or just things you want to bring into this before we talk about your work, talk about why it matters to you, how you do it, all that all that fun stuff? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm excited to chat about uh, about what's important to you and about what's important to us, speaking up and speaking well and seeing how they blend into something that hopefully is super helpful to everyone that's watching. So, I mean, thank you for the kind intro. The feelings are definitely mutual. And I say we just dive in. What do you think, Eli? Anything else to add on your end? Yeah, let's do it. Thanks for having us. And thanks for the kind words, Sheds. Appreciate Amazing. it. Let's do this. Amazing. So, um, so good to see so many people. We have Frank here. Hey, Frank from, uh, from Chicago. Uh, Afsal from Dubai. Very good. Frank in San Jose. Feel free to keep checking in. Uh, and also, please post your comments. If if we come up with resources that we share, we actually don't have an ability to type into the chat. So feel free to do us a favor. If we talk about books or resources or anything, uh, feel free to put links and everything in there as we go. And ask um, us questions too, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, and ask us questions, share your reflections, share your comments, both on how we speak up and how to do it well once we do speak up. And Frank's already got one in here, which I love. So... Um, Eli, Eric, can you guys tell me more of what, what got you hooked into this work of uh, being better presenters, being better speakers, and what it is that you love about doing this work? Great question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think that for me, 
I, I, I and I think and I, I know I can speak on behalf of Eli too. We we went to business school for the same reason everyone goes to business school, which is we envisioned like becoming consultants or bankers or something. And instead, when we had this opportunity to step into professor or faculty member roles at the very beginning of our career, our career went down a totally different path than we expected. And I don't know exactly what it was about it. We weren't we weren't motivated by any bonuses or anything like that. But we just wanted to make the classroom experience for our students absolutely incredible. And we quickly realized that the only way to do that, because the curriculum when we were in academia was set for us, the only way to do that was through our communication skills. That was it. Because the, the lessons we were teaching, they were set. So all we could do to make the classroom an amazing place, an entertaining place, a lively place, and most importantly, I think a place that people look forward to coming to every day, which is not the case with a lot of schooling, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that was to become amazing communicators and use those communication skills to make the classroom an incredible place. And we quickly fell in love with teaching, with public speaking, and with, I think, is sort of becoming its own buzzword today with edutainment. Yeah. With I was making say. sure that when we were teaching something, people were. <laughs> We engaged everyone's pants off so that people didn't even realize they were learning, right? People had no clue. They didn't even have to study for their exam because they were paying such close attention the first time they heard it because we made the classroom an engaging space. Mm. And so that was when we first fell in love with teaching and with public speaking. We couldn't stay in academia forever. And we realized after working in tech for a little while that the only thing we're good at is public speaking <laughs> and teaching. So we figured let's teach people how to be better public speakers. Um, and I think that, you know, for us, it started in a classroom, but public speaking has so many different applications. You can use your public speaking skills to motivate, to inspire, to educate, to sell, to persuade. You can use it in your personal life for a wedding speech or a eulogy or a toast or whatever else it might be. And so all the things that we learned to make us better public speakers in the classroom, we quickly realized those same things apply for any public speaking scenario. And we love teaching people how to get better at it. Nice. Yeah. Eli, Eli what, what else? I mean, that was an amazing, robust answer besides the engaging people's pants off. I think that could be uh, uh, maybe misconstrued. misconstrued. Yes. Okay. Yes. We <laughs> can... Engaging people's pants on. <laughs> <laughs> Even that is questionable. To... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I'll just, I mean, Eli, I mean, obviously yeah. anything to add, but I'm also curious about, you know, when you guys are in the laboratory and seeing people, improve and make a make breakthroughs i mean what is it that you love about this work and of course anything else from that journey that eric just shared that got you into doing this yeah it's it's interesting i think public speaking is interesting because it's it taps into fear and fear is something that's kind of ubiquitous to our species it's mm. very rare to encounter a human who doesn't experience fear and public speaking is a window to tap into some of those really deep psychological things that a lot of people face. And so for Eric and I, it's really fulfilling to help people build a skill that is so useful in so many contexts and so malleable to so many different contexts. And at the same time, it gives us a window to help people build confidence and courage, which is itself a skill that can be used in situations way broader than public speaking. Yeah. So that's that's a huge component for us is the ability to talk about some of the most deep and rich and profound elements of human experience. And then the second thing is Eric and I, so we worked in academia and then we worked in tech for a little bit. And one of the things we noticed when we were working at this tech company was hyper growth. We grew from like 30 people to 150 people in two years. And there was a lot of growing pains and there was a lot of lessons learned and stuff. But one pattern that we started to notice was that it wasn't the best ideas that were moving the business forward. It was mm. the best communicated ideas that were moving the business forward. Mm. And Eric and I sort of looked at that and realized if we have some, some skills that we've honed by being in the gauntlet of the lecture hall in front of hundred people every single day. And if we can take those skills and transfer them to other people through education, because we also love teaching, then maybe we can start to level the playing field a little bit, raise mm. the standard of public speaking across the board. And then the best ideas will win because everyone's a good communicator. So that's nice. part of our mission too. I love all that. We all we have to do is train every single person on the planet to make that a reality, right? Yeah. Well, but I, I think one of the things that's fun though is that there are some of us who are naturally more gifted 
as communicators or orators or, or, or storytellers. I mean, I, I think of the story of um, Steve Sasson, who's an engineer at Kodak. He was the guy in 1975 who literally invented digital photography, like invented it. And oh, he yeah. and he shared it with the with the board and the board freaked out. The executives on the board freaked out because it was going to cannibalize traditional, very vertically integrated film sales. And they went, no. And I'm like, what if he was a more persuasive speaker? Like, I've never met the guy. He's an engineer. So I make up some some, some stories. Or what if he or what if he could partner with? Because mm -hmm. I think, some, you know, I think a couple of things. I mean, a, we are a fable-based, story-based species. Like we learn through story and we move through story and, and experience. And as individuals, we're junk together, we're remarkable. So it's also this notion of like, we form teams, which is, I think, you know, by all means, I think everyone can have the ability to be a better public speaker. And we can also form partnerships with people who are more strong where we're deficient and, and, and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It, what's interesting too is if 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 you look at that Kodak example with uh, Dr. Sasson, was his name? Steve Sasson. I'm not sure if he was a doctor, but he was an engineer. Yeah. We're, we're giving him an honorary PhD. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. The uh, what's interesting is I think that taps into both of our worlds because perhaps there was an element of the culture that that constrained his ability to communicate his message effectively, and. Yeah you can look at the individual and say, perhaps there was constraints individually, either in his confidence to really push his ideas forward or in his competence to actually construct those ideas in a meaningful presentation and in a meaningful narrative that's gonna connect with people so that they buy in. Yeah. So it's really interesting. That's an example that taps into both our worlds seamlessly, I think. Nice, yeah. yeah. To say, I'm inspired by the founder, George Eastman, who democratized photography and made it ubiquitous. Like, Take people on the journey, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Eric, yeah. Where, where were you going to add in here? The only thing I was going to add was actually uh, a little bit of a difference in, in something you said and how mm. we view public speaking. Yeah. What you said was that some people are born with the talent or some people are, are, are born better than others. While that's kind of true, I think it misses something a little bit. If you think about public speaking and what's required to be an amazing public speaker, mm -hmm. I think that it's three main things. It's using your body, using your voice, and being an awesome storyteller or using foundation of narrative and how you communicate. Mm. Well, we already think in story because we're humans. We already are able to use our body and our voice in different ways. So perhaps it's not that people are born with a talent for public speaking, but instead some people are born with more confidence to actually use the tools that everyone is mm. born with. And that's, mm. I think, more in line with how we look at public speaking is that every single person has what it's take has what it takes. Some people use it. Some people need a little bit of help to get over their own psychology to use it. Nice. And, I, and I think it's more about that confidence piece that some people are born with or not, rather than some people are born good or not. Anyone can be good. And that's why we love teaching what we teach. I'm not certain that everyone can be amazing at calculus. I'm certain everyone can be an amazing public speaker. Love that. Love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, there's something here from Frank and love this right in so off the bat, Frank. Thank you, my friend from Chicago. Wants from the talk. Okay, here, here are the promises we have to attempt to uphold. And uh, number two, especially because I think you guys do this very well. Um, so uh, how to balance storytelling with audience engagement. Uh, and, you know, the point of the story is to get a message across. So if it's just stories with no lessons, you know, you got to pull people in. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts there. Ideas for new usage of multimedia in talks, which I think you guys do well on how to use PowerPoint and video and other tools and polls and all these things. So I'd love to hear what you guys are learning there and how to inspire an audience with your message, meaning how do you approach it? Thanks in advance. You guys want to tackle some of that, all that now? I've got some thoughts on number three. Eli, where are you at? Which one do you have some thoughts on? Let, let's uh, let's dive into number three. I've got maybe a thought or two on number one, and we'll we'll unpack number two as well. Let's go. Sure. Maybe let's go in in uh, an un three two in, one. Yeah, let's do let's do three one two. Not reverse order, just completely randomized Ooh, order. Let's throw it completely on its head. Three one All two. Right. All right. Let's Start so with how do you three. Inspire here? an audience with your message. I think that people get the following wrong when people are preparing a presentation. They 
prepare their content and their visuals. And they very rarely, if ever, prepare their delivery, how they're going to say whatever it is they're saying, you know, how they're going to use their body and their voice. And I think that if you want to take an immediate leap in how you public speak, all you got to do is start adding delivery to the preparation component. In other words, every single idea you're sharing, every single slide you have, think to yourself beforehand, how do I want someone to feel about this? Do I want to create suspense here? Do I want to create excitement here? Do I want to create frustration here because I'm about to implement change and I want to get them frustrated about the status quo? Mm. Every single thing you say, you should plan your delivery of it. Ultimately, the way to inspire is to appeal to your audience's emotion. The good news is, you know what sad looks like. You know what excited looks like. You know what frustrated looks like. This is all pretty innately known to all of us. So if you just take an extra second to think, how can I, or how am I going to plan my delivery for this presentation? Once you make that decision, the right delivery emotionally, once you've decided on the emotion, should just ooze out of you. And mm -hmm. if you're connecting to your audience emotionally, that's how you inspire. Love that. Love that. Uh, can, can I just add on to three and then Eli, you can, or we can go to one. Is that good? Yeah, let's do it. So, right, add on. so I even think, you know, you know, like look at the dictionary definition of inspire. It comes from the Latin to breathe life into. It's to give someone the urge to feel and do something, especially emotional, especially creative. Um, when I approach talks as well, I've learned this from my friend, colleague, mentor, Simon Sinek. He, he, he views a talk as solving a jigsaw puzzle. Hmm. So when you solve a jigsaw puzzle, what do you do? Well, you lay out all the pieces, you turn them, you know, front side up. So you know what you're kind of working with here. Then you look at the picture on the box and you start with the end in mind and you go, what am I trying to invoke and inspire and create? How do I want people to feel at the end? And then Eric, I love that of what's the journey you wish to take them on, right? Mm -hmm. And then we build, we start with the outside because those are the easiest pieces to, to find and you set a structure and then you go about filling in those pieces to make the full picture. So I, I love that of like, is what is it that you want people to feel from sharing this talk? Yeah. And then you, and then you get there. Yeah. And, and it's so easy again, because you know what those emotions look like. So then just display them with your body and voice and those emotions will be contagious if you're doing it right. Nice. Love that. I, I want to add one thing to the puzzle analogy and then we'll go to number one. Okay. Another thing people do when they're doing a puzzle and I'm, I'm a puzzle person. So I, I, I know this is true is you flip all the pieces face up, you look at the image, you start with the borders, but one other thing you do is you take the pieces and you put them into categories. Mm. Organized by color often is usually how it goes. That category type thinking is really powerful in presentation construction, which is a component of inspiring an audience with a message. Yep. What a lot of people sometimes forget is that ideas are, they're like Russian dolls in that every idea can fit into another idea and every idea can be unpacked into smaller ideas. And understanding the categories of ideas that you want to get across actually helps you get the ideas across. Because human beings, we don't just process an idea out of nowhere. We fit it into buckets in our mind. So if you understand the buckets of your ideas, you can compose a presentation that's a lot more engaging and a lot more inspirational. Nice. So categorization, useful thing. It's I, I'm kind of getting, Eli, it's like deductive logic. It, it's, very kind much of like, so. it's kind of like you're writing an essay, which is like, okay, here's where I want to take you. Here's what I believe. Now let yeah. me tell you a series of stories and arguments to bring you along such that you can see what I see. Totally. totally. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. I'm, I'm putting Frank's awesome set of questions up here. So uh, we answered, I hope, three. Let us know how we did, Frank. I saw some uh, good response already, but keep the comments and questions coming, everyone. This is great. I think we were going to go to one next. Is that right, Eli? How to balance storytelling with audience engagement. Is yeah. it even a balance? Yeah. So, so, so let's start by, by just first assessing, do you have to balance it? And if we think about stories, stories come in so many different shapes and sizes from a tiny little experience you have one morning that you share with your friend or significant other or colleague to an entire series of a TV show like Game of Thrones, right? Stories come in different shapes and sizes. And often when we think of stories, we jump to Hollywood. One interesting component about Hollywood and the stories that happen in movies and TV is that they are unidirectional. 
you sit and watch. Mm. And a story is really engaging for an audience without soliciting that audience feedback and engagement. Mm -hmm. It's very possible to make a story super engaging for an audience. That's why people will sit through three hours of the Titanic because the story is good. So before we talk about how to incorporate audience engagement and find the balance, because there is utility to engaging an audience, that's for sure, especially like when speaking. But before we get to that, let's first acknowledge if your story is good, the requirement to get audiences involved is less necessary because they will be engaged by the story. People will project themselves into the, narr into the narrative, they'll experience it. And that's a powerful thing. So if your story is good, the need for audience engagement, less necessary. But how do you engage, engage audiences as a balancing point to storytelling? Because if you're always unidirectional in public speaking, you might be missing an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Eric and I do, and this is a, a very specific tip rather than a macro perspective, but every story has some sort of topic. And that's not the idea you're sharing. That's the topic of the story. The idea could be about failure, but the topic of the story is skiing. It was an experience from your life skiing, but the point you want to make is about failure. The topic is something that you can engage audiences on in a very lighthearted way that doesn't force people into something that's too complicated. So if I'm ever telling my skiing story, I always will ask the audience, who here is a fan of skiing? Bunch of hands go up. Who here hates skiing? Who here has never skied before in their life? Cool. Regardless of whether you've skied before or not, I want to tell you about an experience I had in 2009. And then I dive into my story. So you can actually engage audiences on the topic of a story. It's lighthearted. It's fun. People think audience engagement always has to be super valuable, but actually engagement is about connection. It's about human experience. So connect on the topic in a fun, lighthearted way, then dive into your story and make sure your story is really engaging in and of itself. Yeah. The only other thing I'll add is, is getting audience engagement when you're public speaking is hard because there's a diffusion of responsibility when you ask many people a question at once, right? That, that's why when you've been in an audience before, a public speaker has gotten on stage and they say, hey, how's everyone doing today? And then crickets, right? It's like the worst thing in the world. But what you can do, even though you are on stage, is you can start breaking your audience into audiences of one and ask individual people questions, have mm. individual conversations with people in their audience they will respond. There will be no diffusion of responsibility there. And everyone else will love engaging or watching that conversation just the same as people are watching us have this conversation now. So if you want to engage your audience even more, try engaging your audience into, try dividing your audience into audiences of one and engage individuals on a topic and let everyone else watch that engagement happen. Nice. Love that. Uh, a couple of things and then we can go to the, the multimedia. Um, a couple of things that things that come to mind. I mean, context is is everything. And mm -hmm. you know, like when I prepare for for a talk or a presentation, I'm always trying to understand what's the context, what do they need. It's also why I love Q and A, because I can share. All right, here are a couple of ideas. We're talking about speak up culture. Or we're talking about leadership. Or we're talking about the use of story. Or whatever. Then I love that interaction because I'm actually hearing what it is that they need mm -hmm. to hear and what's their context that they're in <laughs> to make it. Uh, in, instead of a one to many, it actually feels more like a conversation, something I love. Um, the other thing I love to do is, mm -hmm. it's just a fun little thing, is asking people, you know, who who here loves skiing? Who here doesn't love skiing? Who here yeah. does not like to raise their hands when prompted to in public sessions <laughs> to get funny. people going? <laughs> and then I pointed them and I said, made you. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts there on Q&A and context? And then we can talk about multimedia as well. I think that's all that uh, I got. I'll share one thing on Q&A. A lot of people are afraid of Q&A, talking about the fears and stuff that go along with public speaking. Yep. And a, a huge realization that Eric and I have had that has really shaped our experience of that component of really high stakes presentations is people have a misconception. When a question is posed, they think an answer is required. That's not true. When a mm. question is posed, a response is required. An answer is not. You have to respond and acknowledge that the question was asked, but that doesn't mean you have to answer it. And I think when people are in a public speaking scenario, there's a baked in sense of authority. And so people then feel they're supposed to have all of the answers on the planet, especially if it's a topic they're supposed to know a lot about. But Eric and I don't know everything there is to know about public speaking, nor will we ever. We yeah. obsess over this every single day and we still don't know everything there is to know and won't ever know everything there is to know. 
So people will stump us and people will ask us questions we don't have answers to. Always respond, but you don't need an answer. That's a helpful realization that I've had and I know Eric has had too. That's right, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. It points Eli to, to vulnerability and accountability. Mm -hmm. Totally. You're right to say that is a great question and I'd rather answer honestly than answer with, with fake information. Mm -hmm. Here's what yeah. I do know. Here's what I don't know. But I'm saying out loud to to all of you, this is an incomplete answer such that we can complete it by the end of the week. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Very good. Okay. And then finally, multimedia. Um, Frank included ideas for new usage of multimedia in talks. Any? I have a couple of ideas. I'd love to hear from you both first. I, I think that Eli should tackle at least the first answer because at Speaker Labs, Eli is the PowerPoint guru. The visual aids that this guy creates are absolutely mind blowing. Maybe I'll have a couple things to add after I hand it off to him. Eli, you cool to take it? Yeah, sure. So I, I think what's interesting, when the pandemic first hit and Eric and I were forced into virtual, it really pushed us to think about multimedia in a different way than we had before. Cause in the past we were doing everything live and we had a slide deck behind us and that was it. Mm -hmm. And we created really great slides. And I'm very proud of the slides that we always created, but I don't think we ever thought truly outside the box about how to use them. And then the pandemic hit. And at first we thought we are not going to be able to offer an incredible experience virtually because we've got the slides that now make up 90% of the screen and our box is a tiny little head. It's not going to be effective. Mm. then we realized that it actually creates an opportunity as long as you look at it differently. If the slides are now the focal point and you have to work to get people to look at you and process you, then maybe you can use the slides in a really effective way that you haven't used in the past. So one of the things Eric and I have done is we've created these sort of like, <coughs> I'll call them games. They're forms of interactivity. And they're a lot more enjoyable and fun when every person is sitting and staring at a screen. They have the same vantage point. So it's sort of like if you're, <laughs> you're, a, you're a sports fan, right, Shads? Yeah. <coughs> so Water break. do you remember the Blue Jays coming back against the Texas Rangers? You know, that like the Joey Bats bat flip game. Yeah, I know. I know where I was. <laughs> Now, if you could have been at that game, sitting in the front row watching that, that would have been an amazing experience, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're at home watching it, there's something different. They don't try to make it the same. They use commentary and different camera angles and they play with things. We look at multimedia the same way where don't try to make it the same. Try to play with things and use it to your advantage. So for us, the best example is... is we used to just get people to the front of the room live and do some public speaking exercises. Now what we do is we actually get people to look at their screen and do these exercises that sort of come in the form of games that rely on them looking at their screen. That may not be as available if the screen's behind them when they're in person. Nice. So it's it's leveraging the, the multimedia rather than looking at it as a constraint. How can it be an opportunity? Yeah. The other thing that I think is important is Every single person watching this right now knows what bad let's, or at least for now, let's equate multimedia for public speaking as your slide deck. You know, obviously you can use music and different other technologies that might make your zoom call or whatever uh, a little bit better, a little bit more interesting. But if you're talking about just your slides, everyone knows what a bad slide deck looks like, right? It's just too much stuff. We talk a lot about building slide decks in our programs, you know, for, for hours and hours about all the different tools that you can use to make it better. But if you only take one thing from all of that programming that we have on effective visual aids, if your audience cannot read any given slide in three seconds or less, your slide sucks, start again. <laughs> really, really simple. Everything else that we teach on visual aids stems from that foundation. If it cannot be read in three seconds or less, you have a bad slide. Really simple. And let, let, let's say processed in three seconds or less, because reading maybe implies words and stuff, but you're not always using words. Sometimes it's yeah. charts and figures and graphs or pictures. Or even pictures that can be too overwhelming, right? Yeah. But I, I, I love that it's, it's what's, what's the job of this, both in a story you're sharing or how to articulate something or a slide on, on multimedia as well. But it's, yeah. it's you know, 
sometimes there's room for flowery language and sucking people into details of a story, but it has to be with intent and with purpose, which yeah. is also, I think, you know, I think the standard can be, how can you get the most across in the least amount of words and time or slide where, um, yeah. other things with multimedia I've seen, I mean, I haven't done this, but I've seen people actually have green screens with slides behind them and they become yeah. like a, a meteorologist weather person with the slide. Haven't done it yet. If you can power to you, um, use of polls, whether it's in Zoom polls or Mentimeter or these other things that can really engage people, especially if it's a if it's a large room. I, I'm also a really big believer as a facilitator. If you can get a video clip from a movie that can explain something better than you can, you show that clip ten times <laughs> out of ten. Yeah. Um, that's something fun that I've seen and and done as well. Um, any other thoughts on this? Or Eli, I know you brought a. Um, a game to the table is now, should we do it? Should we do it now? And then maybe have a couple final questions after we play the game. Is that sound sure. good? I think yeah, it'd be fun to get it. you in the hot seat. Let's get you sweating yeah. a little bit and have you and, play one of our games. And, and Mary goes, where can we see examples of your visual aids right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, maybe, this maybe isn't, uh, this maybe isn't the best example of our vis visual aids. This is more uh, a game for fun that we've got for sheds here, but. But Mary, if if, uh, if you're interested in our visual aids, the best way to see it is to come to one of our programs because that's where we use them. And we, we often use all of the tools and tricks and perspectives and strategies that we teach people to make our slides really awesome. But we don't really have that many public displays of our slides, do we, Eric? No, I think that we use each form of media that we're using as it's intended, right? So our slides are not on our website. Our website is built as a website. Our, our online programs have animations and our in-person programs use visual aids. So, I mean, I think that, yeah, you can't really find our slides online. You got to come to our program for that. You can find a lot about how we look at branding and making things look beautiful online, but how that applies to a visual aid for a presentation is going to be a little different. And and just Elon and Eric, for Mary and anyone else who wants to learn more, it's, it's speakerlabs.com. Is that right? Nope. Dot .ca. Speakerlabs.ca. Dot .ca. Dot .ca. Dot .ca. Yeah. Speakerlabs.ca. A proudly uh, Canadian company. Check it out. Thank you. All right. Eli, Eric, I'm in your capable hands. I have no idea what's coming here. So this is true improv, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, this is one of our favorite games. It's it's called PowerPoint Karaoke. I, I don't even think we invented it, but we've got our own spin on it. We are not going to get you to sing, don't worry. But what we are going to do is we are going to hit you with a slide deck that you have never seen before. We are going to change the slides with no warning whatsoever. And we want you to present to it as though you made the slide deck and this is your big keynote presentation. I feel like I'm on Jimmy Fallon and there should be like a speaker lab karaoke, like a, like a theme song to this. You know, well. some people actually stop me on the street and tell me that I look like Jimmy Fallon. I think they're completely out to lunch, but I have gotten that before. So I'm, I'm glad you're kind of seeing it, I guess maybe in the way I speak. So <laughs> Shed, is, is, are the instructions clear? We are going to hit you with the slide deck. There's going to be no warning for when we switch slides and you need to speak to it on the topic of Wait, Eli, before, you, with... before you give the topic i do want to say one other yeah, thing please. before we get into the game because the reason these these types of games are useful is because and sheds maybe if, if if you can speak to it a little bit it would be nice to hear human beings are afraid of what other human beings think of them that's par for the course that's mm -hmm. baked into, into the human os it's part of the operating system and even people who have put themselves in front of other people a lot they, they still can feel that stuff. It's the ability to not get rid of those feelings, but to move forward when those feelings are present that differentiates the best from the rest. Mm -hmm. And so part of the reason we like this game is because it is inherently unpredictable, which yep. public speaking can be. It, is, it, it evokes a little bit of that feeling of, of uncertainty and ambiguity and nervousness. And so maybe you might be feeling a little bit of that before going into it. How am I going to come off on this live session in front of a lot of people while it's being recorded? Thanks for the and reminder, Eli. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> no, but it's an important reminder, Shed, because you are a professional public speaker. And even you have those feelings. Yes, right? for so sure. No one is immune to those feelings. And, yeah. and I think it's how you navigate them that's important. Yeah. And that's, just that's and just and, and just to tell you, Eli, and for everyone out there, like this is the thought process that's going through my head, which is like, oh. And then I and then I remind myself it doesn't need to be good. This is an exercise. This is a game. This is learning. Just have fun with it. So yeah. anyway, yeah. I'm I'm going and, through that right now just to let play out loud what my inner monologue is. 
But this, this, this is why it's so important to talk about because I think a lot of public speaking programs or videos online, they talk about the tips and tricks for what to do, mm. but they don't talk about the stuff that actually empowers you to do it, which is all up here. And the reality is, if you look at this and put a lot of pressure on it, like this is this game is going to make or break my career, you've added fangs to the situation that doesn't have any fangs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so part of the things that I want to do before we get into the game is just let everyone watching know fear is the inhibitor to great public speaking, way more than strategy and competency and tips and tricks. You can have all the best strategies in the world, but if when a situation like this pops up and you've got to speak in front of people and you have no idea what's coming and it's unpredictable, and it's uncertain and it's ambiguous. If you get in here and you start worrying way too much about what people think of you, that will constrain your ability to speak way more than a lack of strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's why we wanted to, wanted to play one of these games is to give us an opportunity to talk about some of that stuff. And uh, even the professional speakers we work with, the people who lead very large companies that we work with, they experience this stuff too. And it's important to acknowledge that experience, but move forward anyways. Nice. So, Love it. Love it. With that, we are going to give you a topic. Okay. The last slide you'll see in PowerPoint karaoke looks like this, where you can wrap up with your final thoughts. And <clears throat> what I'll say before we dive in, Sheds, is you've probably heard the classic Maya Angelou quote, people don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. Eric and I have our own little tweak on that, which is people do remember what you say. <laughs> they just remember what you say differently based on how you made them feel. But if you can make people feel something, bring them up, bring them down, take them on an emotional journey, regardless of what you're saying, that's some good communication too. So we will put the first slide up. We'll give you your topic. And we want you to speak. It's not more than you know a minute, maybe a minute and a half, nothing like nothing crazy. But we want you to give us a presentation about advice to your younger self. Okay. And we'll count you down, Shed. You can start in three. Two, one. Advice to our younger selves. It's always fun to look in the mirror and to look behind and see what we've learned based on how far we've come and where we've come from. And so as we go to my next slide here, it really behooves us to look at perspective. When we look at things from outside ourselves, when we elevate up to the balcony, go up to 100,000 feet and see the curvature of the earth, the curvature of our lives, of our experiences, and to reflect that back as we see forward. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room, because there is an elephant in the room. What's this wisdom? How can we go and go forward and behind and actually learn about this stuff? What is the elephant in the room here? Well, the elephant in the room here is that it's better to be more like Jim Carrey than it is to be like Biden. Embrace your inner quirk, be funny, Liar, liar, pants on fire. Great movie, by the way. Not talking about Biden. The elephant in the room is that it does make sense to bring in humor, to take people on a journey with you as you go. I'm just going to pause here because silence is effective. <laughs> Chocolate ice cream. <laughs> the cherry on top. As you go on and listen to advice from your past self it's enjoy the ice cream enjoy the ice cream but there's one kicker and we all know this truth that everything is bigger in texas <laughs> instead of that one scoop pile on three because you only live once and share it with the people that you love so as you look back at the things that you've learned start with that end in mind what have you learned and pile on that that ice cream these are the final thoughts because i was one slide ahead which is the advice from your former self, embrace humor. Your advice from your future self, embrace humor and pile on three scoops of chocolate ice cream because it's always more enjoyable. Mic drop, thank you. <laughs> that was that, that was awesome, Shed. And and that is a very, we have a whole bunch of public speaking games that we, that we make people play in our programs. That's the hardest one by far. That is not easy. And those pictures are designed to throw you off in a huge way. Um, but I think you did an amazing job. I love how when you were struggling, you decided to make it a little bit more meta and you just said, I'm going to use silence here because silence is effective. Those moments really humanized you. And then the moments that you were really flowing, those were awesome too. Eli, what do you think? I, I just want to point out a couple of things that you did really well. 
And I want to point out one thing that if we were your public speaking coaches, I would tell you to try on even more next time. Yeah. So remember body and voice, right? That's the, that's the simple stuff, but there's so many different ways to use it. And I think sometimes we fall in the trap of thinking there's a right way to use body and voice. That is not true. Really what matters is using these tools like you, if you can show up on stage the way you show up when you're having dinner with your best friend, that's a good thing. So there is no right, but I do want to point out something you did that is a very, a very good thing to use for a lot of people some of the time. Mm -hmm. And that is specificity in your gestures. A lot of people will use gestures, but they, they do like the palm up, palm down thing. They're like, so today I want to talk about ice cream and how you should get more ice cream in Texas than you should anywhere else. And they're just doing the palm up, palm down. They start to look like a magician. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. But if you add specificity to your hand gestures, it becomes a lot clearer what you're trying to say to people and it becomes more engaging too. So when you were talking about the globe and you were talking about how round it is and the curvature of the globe and zooming out to a hundred feet and having perspective, those gestures were really, really effective. Specificity of gesture is more important than any other, any other tip around arms and, and, and that type of stuff. Specificity, really good. Mm. One thing that I think is an area where you could have done it a little better is you said, I'm going to pause now because silence is good. <laughs> what if you just paused? It's very funny. Eric and I, Eric and I talk to a lot of people about a lot of different things, but when we get to talking about the expression part of speaking, not the composition of narrative, not the storytelling, not the slides, the expression, silence is one of the biggest enemies that people run into. They either fill it with verbal glue like the ums and uhs, that sort of stuff. Or they rush through silences or they try to hedge their silences with some, some sort of caveat. I'm going to be silent now. Or they try to bake it into the content, pause for effect. But really, if you just pause, in a conversation, if you just pause for way too long, people will want to fill that space for you. But in a one-to-many context, a presentation, public speaking, You can just be silent. And a quick little tip for everyone is when you're silent with your voice, don't be silent with your body. Look around, do some gestures. But silence is, is a super powerful thing in one-to-many communication. I think that's the thing you could have done a little better and owned it a bit more. Nice. I want to I give you one more piece of feedback, Shed. But first, I want to hear what your inner experience was of doing that exercise. How, yeah. did, did you enjoy it? Was it hard? Was it easy? What was going on in your head? Uh, thank you. And thanks for the feedback and keep it coming. Um, the for me it was it was very hard oscillating between because again it's this is the antithesis of how i say to prepare like it's improv yeah. duh i love this exercise because i think we can get in trouble as speakers when we script something and prepare because if something shifts or happens you're totally screwed and it's hard to respond and so i love this exercise because it just teaches you to go with the flow and have fun with it yeah um the the uh i just ran out of things to say and so i just tried to make a joke with the silence piece and i agree with you eli <laughs> fully that use use silence but i was doing the silence is good so i'm just not going to talk now yeah i was using it more as humor um and it was uh, funny yeah. that mission was accomplished thank yeah. you thank agreed you. But yes agreed. but i fully agree with you when using silence use it and don't say that you're using it but yeah no that was my uh my thought i it I had to constantly remind myself, how can I connect the image of the slide to the topic, which was advice to my younger self. So that's to remind... actually added pressure on yourself. What you could have done, and you know this when you're in your comfort zone, but it, it, you were on the spot, right? If you didn't have any way to talk about chocolate covered ice cream, you could have easily said, now I, I bet you think I'm going to talk about chocolate covered ice cream right now, but I'm not. Instead, I'm going to give myself one more piece of advice to my younger self. You, you can, you're not as constrained by what's going on as possible. And I think that I know you are able to see that when you're not on the hot seat, but mm. the hot seat colors are, are, are psychology and it changes everything. And I think that you experienced that too. Totally. Well, the only thing, yeah. the only other added piece of feedback that I would give you is one of the things that we really focus on in our program is how to have impact with your body and voice. And one of the main theses that we share is that the best way to do that is by adding contrast. I think that the pace in which you were speaking 
was best in class. Like if we were to count your words per minute, it was probably really, really, really good on average. But I think you could have added more diversity, or more contrast in your pace. Mm. So uh, as an example, I'll display it and, tr and try to introspect for how you feel as I create the contrast, okay? Next, I want to talk to you about the president, Joe Biden. And the other thing I want to do is chat about my friend Jim Carrey, because Jim Carrey is hilarious too. Just by speaking slow and then fast, the whole energy in the room changes, doesn't it? So think about how you can add some more contrast in the mm. way you speak. I think that might level it up too. Nice. Yeah. And I've even liked, I like the use, especially with, with microphones, the use of, of, of whisper, that when you totally speak really quietly, <laughs> people hear it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. leading in now. Yeah. 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 I love that too. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So cool. Well, thanks for letting me do that. And thanks for watching me embarrass myself there, team. That was fun. We played that game many times. That was probably the best one we've seen. No, Eli? <laughs> that's, that's up there. That's top 1,000 for now. That's, <laughs> that was great. That was well done. Very well done. Awesome. Awesome. Um, gentlemen, here, here's one other question that came in from Afsal. We've kind of answered it but maybe we can answer more uh head on and i think it was uh pavel or pavel these these are recorded so you can come back to this link i also load these onto my youtube page after so there's you can watch this recording and i think i've done 15 of these lives so far so there's all of them there uh some awesome ones how can we structure a talk a public talk to be more effective and to get everyone's attention perhaps something we've already touched upon a little bit but any sort of head-on comments from the, the, the both of you and we we can begin to land the plane here I've got two things on the tip of my tongue, Eli. Uh, sure. Why don't I start with the first perspective that I've got, which is that saying less is better than packing tons of stuff into your presentation. A common fear that not everyone experiences, but a common fear that some people have is, how am I going to fill all this time? So they pack so much stuff into their presentation and then nothing becomes clear because they're rushing through all those things rather than getting really deep and meaningful idea transfer around one or two or three things. So less is more. That's the first thing that I would say when it comes to, to a public talk. The other thing is what you want to avoid when you're doing a presentation is you want to avoid the classic subtitle and bullet point approach. Everyone's been an audience member in a presentation like that. And it's guaranteed not the favorite presentation that you've ever sat in. So don't be that kind of public speaker. Mm. Subtitle bullet point. You know, if you're doing like a town hall, for example, marketing, point, 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 sales, point, 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 product, point, point, point. That's not an engaging presentation. What you want to be really mindful of instead of just the subtitles and the bullet points is how are you transitioning from one idea to the next? People overlook that too. So if you can create really smooth transitions from one section or one idea to another section or another idea, your whole presentation will have more flow. Your audience will always know how everything ties together and that's going to make them more engaged. So think about your transitions as you get from one section or one idea to the next. I love that. And even the use of story and images and especially if it's a presentation that's more than just you to come together and create an arc and a theme and work together to create an experience. Love that. Yeah. 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 Eli, anything else from you? Yeah. I just want to share sort of a, a, a metaphor for that, that Eric and I always like to reference. A lot of presentations feel to the audience like puddle jumping. You jump from one puddle to another puddle to another puddle. You're just jumping around. But when you actually are super conscientious about the way you connect each idea to the next idea, what ends up happening is all those puddles start to coalesce into a stream and they flow seamlessly from one to the next. The best structure for a presentation should feel fluid like a stream. And there's a lot of ways to create transitions. We have some ways we like to teach people, but I'll just give you a really simple way. Beg the question. So if you're talking about one idea and then you've got another idea, what question segues you from one to the next? And questions are a good way to leapfrog you from one idea to another way to another idea in a way that's quite seamless. So beg the question. Do you, do you have an example? Right, you like. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a really high level example, but you know, we were talking earlier about what is public speaking and Eric was sort of talking about, you know, there's body and voice, which is delivery. There's also what we're talking about now content, which is both the ideas you have and the composition of those ideas, the structure. So let's say we were giving a presentation about public speaking and wanted to talk about the different components of public speaking. And we dove into delivery and then we were going to talk about content. What a lot of people do is they 
make their last point about delivery, and then they make their first point about content with no seamless, conscientious transition or connection between the two. But maybe you do something where there's a bit more of a question. Delivery is so important, but is delivery everything when it comes to public speaking? Or is there more that you need to think about? Mm. You actually need to think about content too. What that's done is it has segued me and my audience to the next point. Nice. Those segues, those sequiturs, those transitions, those are very necessary for structuring a good presentation. Nice. Mm -hmm. Love that. Love that. Asking questions to bring people along with your with your train of thought. Love that. Mm -hmm. um, gentlemen, anything else top of mind or heart you wanted to speak to or share that we've yet to? Um, this has been such a blast and fun. I hope it's been valuable for those listening in. I always love hearing from other people who are such good and such frequent public speakers like you. So Eli and I, we think about public speaking all day, every day. And what that sometimes does is that makes us have blinders. You know, we only think about what we're doing and our curriculum, but you yourself, Shed, you're an amazing and a professional public speaker too. Thank so I'm you. curious if you had public speaking advice, if there was like one silver bullet that you could offer on the topic, what would that be? Because maybe it's something that Eli and I have been overlooking a little bit as we've created our own curriculum and, and you know, our, our own thoughts on how we help people. The, the, the one thing that a mentor has taught me, so a couple of things spring to mind uh, and both came from, from mentors. So one is particularly when I'm getting those nerves uh, um, or, you know, sometimes uh, I'm doing a lot of public speaking if it's Zoom or I'm traveling and it can be tiring. And I remind myself, show up to give, show up to serve, show up to give, show up to serve. Like just a little reminder to either get over the fear or get into how can I show up and not make this about me, even mm. though the spotlight might, might be on me, is show up to give, show up to, to serve. And that sort of, you know, I, I'm not a believer in fear, fearless. There's, there, there's no such thing as a fearless. We can fear less. Uh, mm -hmm. Or we can, you know, if, if it isn't for fear, we ha we'd have no need for courage. So show up to serve, show up to give really helps. The other is it's not about perfection, it's about progress. So mm. uh, Drew Dudley, who's a great speaker, taught me that there's the, there's the talk that you want to give, the talk that you end up giving, and the perfect talk you give to your steering wheel on the way home. There's, <laughs> there's, like, there's always something at the end, oh, I should have, or I could have, or I didn't. And it's like, eh. No one knows except you and just do what you can with the time you got to make some progress. And I'm gear. so glad I asked because now I get to use that analogy too. I love that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, uh, I have a question. If there's one question that you would love to have the answer to, to take your public speaking to a, a whole new stratosphere or even one increment better, hmm. what question would you want to have answered? Not to say that we're going to have the answer, but I just would love to know, like, what is the next step for you and what seems to be a challenge or an obstacle in the way that could be simplified for you or something? Yeah, that's a great one. Something for me is, you know, part of my strength, I think, as a speaker is going with the flow and improv and, oh, I didn't expect to share the story, but it's just come up and it's perfect, so I'm going to share it. But for me, it's that balance between structure and planning and what am I gonna do? It's it's actually why I like a PowerPoint presentation because if I don't have a PowerPoint, I just kind of go and I hope. So for me, a PowerPoint really helps keep me focused and structured. So I guess for me, the question is how to balance um, going with the flow and sharing the stories I wanna share with structure that doesn't hinder me. Mm. That makes sense? Yeah, it's a great question. It's not dissimilar from the question about structure, in a sense. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot that can go into that, and I'm sure Eric and I can can dig in and really try to unpack strategies and insights there. I will share one thing that that could be useful for you. Who knows? But the uh, and then I would love to tackle uh, Vipin's question about forgetting stuff. So maybe we'll yes. we'll we'll talk about both. But <laughs> if you ever you're ever going somewhere and you've never been there before, you put the destination into Waze or Google Maps or something or MapQuest if you're real old school, but you put the destination in, right? And then it gives you directions to get from where you are to where you're going. But the directions, they're, they're always focused on the pivoting points. When, like, when you get into your car and start driving, it says, turn left here. And then it doesn't say, now go straight, 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 and now turn right. It just tells you turn left. And then it tells you where to turn right. I think if when you're looking at all of your content, your presentation, 
if you are super clear, and I mean like crystal clear on what the pivot points are, what those transitions are, then everything in between, let's call those the straights, that's where you can have some freedom to run. But it's the pivot points that you need to know intimately because that's what keeps you on track to get to your destination. Mm. So I think that's that's a decent mental model for how to blend a little bit of, of freedom oh, nice. to improvise and structure. Even if you don't have slides, if you have the pivot points anchored in your mind, that can be helpful. It's kind of like, here are the things I need to do. And there's sort of some wiggle as exactly. you go. Know. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Neat. Um, a great question from Vipin. I forget my stuff before presenting how to remember the content. I, I've got some thoughts, Eric. If you have any, you can feel free to chime in first. Uh, the, the only thing I'll say to start is that it's okay to forget what you were going to say. If you're sitting around having a conversation with your colleagues or with your friends or with your family and you forget what you were going to say, what you do is you say, damn, I forgot what I was going to say. And you just move on. That same thing is available to you when you're on stage. But you tell yourself that it's not because this is higher stakes. Actually, if you admit on stage that you forgot what you were going to say and you own it and you dive forward anyways, that sort of vulnerability is going to make your audience like you more, not less. So that's the first thing. But Eli, anything on actually trying to not forget <laughs> rather than yeah. how you handle forgetting? Yeah. What I'll say is understanding Trump's memorization 100% of the time. So if you really understand what you're trying to get across then you may say it a thousand different ways, but you'll get it across understanding Trump's memorization. But it does help to internalize ideas in your mind and have it really sit there. So here's a, a, a very tactical structure that I find is helpful more often than not. And it's malleable. You can make it your own a little bit, but call it the 532. Read your presentation five times. Like read it through five times. And that doesn't mean verbatim, like you have to ri have written a script, but look at your slides and sort of, okay, on this slide, I'm going to talk about Jim Carrey and Joe Biden. On this slide, I'm going to talk about ice cream. On this slide, I'm going to talk about taxes. Like just click through and know what you're going to be saying by sort of just thinking it. That's five times. Three times, say it out loud. Don't perform it. Just speak it out loud. Sit down, lie down on a bed with your laptop beside you. Click through the slides and just speak it out loud three times. Do it quickly. Do it rapidly. Don't worry about precise language. Just really try to speak it through. And then two times, write it out. Slide one is going to be about Joe Biden and Jim Carrey, and I'm going to talk about X, Y, and Z. Slide two is going to be about chocolate. I'm going to talk about X, Y, and Z. Slide three, and write it out. And that combination of in your mind, reading it or speaking it in your mind, speaking it out loud and writing it, tends to help people internalize material pretty well, pretty efficiently. If you're constrained for time, make it a three, two, one. If you've got lots of time in a big presentation, make it a 10, six, four. However, you play with those numbers, but in your head, out loud, written. Nice, yeah. nice. I also think again, this this can be the use that if you're relying on, if you don't have a PowerPoint or slides, you can if it helps you. Um, I also like to view it as partner with your with your audience to say, okay, here's where I'm going to take you. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to talk about this. And so, if you lose yourself, you can actually say to your audience. Now, where was I and where was I going to go next? I know Love I made this that. point, Love right? That. And then you actually have your audience filling it in for you. They're partnering with you is a really fun, fun thing that I think we can do as well. That's an awesome yeah. perspective. So cool. human. So cool. Love yeah. It. Eli, Eric, this has been such uh, an awesome treat. You guys are masters of your craft and do it with such great, um, genuine desire to serve and just have fun with it. And you had... I had a lot of fun with you here today and I get the sense that you guys did too. So thank you so thank much you. for joining us, for giving uh, any final words. Again, you can learn more speakerlabs.ca, O Canada. Um, anything else from you gentlemen as we close out today? I usually like ending with in case I don't see you. Good afternoon, <laughs> good evening, and good night. So should there we just end it there? I think we can. <laughs> Thanks, Chad. Appreciate Thanks. it a lot. This was super fun. Thanks for having us, Chad. Let's do it again soon. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Take care, Thank everyone. You.